Welcome to Dice and Mind, a podcast hosted by Brad Brown and Jason Kaufman to explore the intersection of life, games, science, music, philosophy, and creativity through interviews with leading creatives. All are welcome in this space. I think a while back we abandoned the process by which we would intro our podcasts and talk about it as if we hadn't talked to our guest yet. Yep. And so I'm, yep. I, I, since we've done that um, with the guests we'll introduce here in a moment, we had, and I think you'll agree, um, one of the more fascinating conversations that we've ever had. Number one. Yeah. And number two, um, it went, and I don't even know how to put it. And you, you will be so much more, um, you'll have a better way of putting it than I will, but it, it was just, it took a different direction. It's it, all it, it is. did, but it did, but it took it, it, it took, it went in a direction that was just, I'll use, I'll use very basic vernacular so much cooler than I thought. In multiple ways. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that's fair. So that's, that's, that was my point. Um, I was excited when you invited this person to join us and I'll let you, inter I'll let you introduce them here in a second. Um, I know that you were cause, um, because of their background and everything, yep. Yep. but, um, we brought them in for a different reason than a lot of the other, <laughs> um, you know, media yes. experiences they've had. So why don't I pause there and I'll let you, because you really champion this one. And, and for me, I honestly, it was, it, I can't thank you enough for doing it just because it was something that I never would have experienced otherwise. Cause it was sitting on the periphery of my, you know, of my realm of yeah. experience and everything. Yeah. So, so thanks. So I think, okay. So maybe a little context probably helps the discussion and, um, and our listeners. So, uh, as, as, as my girls have often heard me say, and I think, as I said, either during or, or outside of the interview with their guest, um, my first love was astronomy. I fell in love with it in elementary school. You told me your first love was somewhat different, but well, let's save that for the the after show. Well, astronomy has been healthy for me and sustainable. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, but but it really was it. it yes. My my first love, as you all know, my first love was astronomy. Uh, now uh, I am no math wonk. You're way better at math than I am. I can do the math I need to do for my research, and I enjoy that. But but that's the extent of it. And of course, these days you can't go into astronomy or anything like that without just a really, really good facility with math. Okay, fine. But my first love was astronomy. Later on, I would encounter psychology as a science and fall even more deeply in love. And that's the path I took. And I, I'm glad for that. But I have never, I have never let go of my interest in space and space exploration. It's only now in my career, uh, as you and I have talked about a bunch offline, that I've ventured into adjacent areas in terms of more philosophical or policy-based work, right? It's probably as close as I'll ever get to space, if you will. Um, but I follow a number of the missions, especially the NASA, JPL, APL, and other missions, ESA, um, all of these, uh, I follow a lot of them because they're brilliant. And and one of the missions, especially, uh, I've been pretty devout in following with, with another friend. Um, we've often talked about it. Uh, I've made it a point to watch, you know, watch the live streams. Because You've it's talked just about amazing. this one a lot with me. A lot. I, I have, haven't I? Okay, mm -hmm. so so um, we had the very good fortune um, actually, quite recently, as we record this, quite recently, as we record this, uh, we had the very good fortune to talk with Professor Dante Loretta. Now, we'll we'll state his bio shortly, um, and it's it's a, a very abbreviated bio for an exceptionally detailed CV. But uh, Dante is the PI of the Osiris Rex, now the Osiris Apex mission. PI for those that. 
Oh, thanks. Uh, the principal investigator. So not just the lead scientist, but the lead of mm -hmm. the mission. And uh, and and Osiris Rex, Rex went to asteroid Bennu and vacuumed up. That's a whole other discussion we won't have, but vacuumed up a lot of material. And we'll talk about all of these things uh, in a few minutes in the interview with Dante, who is so gracious with his time. He is a truly, truly busy individual right now, um, given everything he's doing professionally and especially with space exploration. However, as you said, that's not why we asked him on. Mm -hmm. uh, we had come across. You did the uh, you did a bait and switch with him a little bit. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, you, legitimately and not legitimately. No, no one was complaining. I don't think we no, heard no, him no, complaining. No. You know, please tell us about your life's work. Um, mm -hmm. but but it was it was a wonderful opportunity, Dante. It really wasn't a bait and switch. I'm just razzing yeah. Jason a little. Yeah, yeah, well deserved, nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Um, so so we had invited Dante, who so uh so warmly responded quickly like that would be great thanks um because we had heard him on uh on a wonderful podcast planetary radio uh, and and he had mentioned in passing his love of rpgs and it's like oh man come on so we extended an invitation and he was good enough to have us uh, ha have some time with us and 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 geek out and you're going to hear about that and you'll hear that that Dante's Geekery is strong. Uh, he hasn't just been playing RPGs and board games for, I mean, since since he was a kid, but he has developed, designed, play tested, distributed them. Some, and I, I'm I'm not a board game guy, but these look fascinating. Yes. And, and I mean, he's had wonderfully successful Kickstarters. So he, yeah, we talk about uh, in the upcoming interview momentarily, we talk a lot about uh, the science he's involved in, cutting edge science. And he shares some of that, which was really cool. But we really focused on the nerd aspect that we all share of what what games do you like? What's your history? What, what do you take from that? That said, and I think maybe we'll transition with this. Mm -hmm. Neither of those pieces, you know where I'm going with this. Neither yeah. of those pieces are what really got to us where afterwards you and I offline were talking about it that night. Yeah. That um, as, as you will all hear, and um, as you will all hear in a moment, uh, Dante Loretta clearly demonstrates just a wonderful dedication to his family, to his yeah. children, to his wife. And uh, we weren't expecting, I certainly wasn't expecting it was going to go in that direction at all, but he kept making comments and it was like, wait a minute, there's something here. And the way you'll hear him toward the end of the interview chat about his values, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, it really resonates with me and it really resonates, I know, with you. I think you and I, Brad, uh, and our listeners can clearly tell this. You and I try to be very, very present for our families, especially our children, even though they're growing up and going to college and all these things. And and we've yeah, go ahead. So, but so are his too. I mean, his are he even says that. But but I think, well, I'll I'll talk more about it afterwards. But I think he he exemplifies something that transcends. Yeah, that should transcend science, and yeah. we'll get more into that. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful way to go. So let's um mm -hmm. let's check it out. Dante Loretta is a Regents Professor of Planetary Science and Cosmochemistry at the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. He is an expert in near Earth asteroid formation and evolution. He is the leader of NASA's OSIRIS-REx Asteroid Sample Return Mission, the United States' premier mission to visit one of the most potentially hazardous near-Earth asteroids, survey it to assess its impact hazard and resource potential, understand its physical and chemical properties, and return a sample of this body to Earth for detailed scientific analysis. He also maintains an active research program in cosmochemistry and meteoritics.
All right. Well, Dante, as we just said a moment ago in getting to meet you and greet you, thank you so much for, for joining us on Dyson Mind for a little bit. It's a thrill to talk to you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, really, really appreciate that. It was such a sweet response uh, you sent to our cold call email of, hey, any interest in geeking out? Um, I have to say, I'm, I, I am, well, I'm a little starstruck because astronomy was my first love out of elementary. And then, you know, then I, then I encountered psychology and I fell even more deeply in love with that. And I went that route, but even like now my, uh, my daughter has her first astronomy class. And so she, she's prepping for her final exam and she asked me a question and it's like, I'm, I'm not sure I was prepared for all the other questions. Um, but I followed, I followed Osiris Rex. I mean, you know, since you guys started announcing that how many years ago and now Osiris Apex and watch the live stream. I mean, this is the stuff that like we both sometimes just try to be home for so we can stream. And and I'll just before we transition, I'll just say um thoroughly enjoyed your book and largely because you did such a lovely job of humanizing the science and making it clear that science is this wonderful, wonderful, deeply personal, passionate thing, but it's done by people. Absolutely. And that was a big part of my motivation to write The Asteroid Hunter was to tell the human story. It I tried to make it an like an action adventure because there was, you know, challenges around every corner. Benny was sometimes literally throwing curveballs at us. <laughs> and at the end of the day, it was the team, the people, the camaraderie that carried us forward and created all those amazing memories. Yeah, incredible. I remember reading that, like, this is an action, this is an adventure. And my first thought was, oh no. And and it it was so good. It worked so well because you really felt I really felt like I was there, like I got to see it through all of your eyes, which is just super cool. Thank However, you, so you know, that's the oh, please use that's that's not why we actually asked if you would come and join us. I was I think I was listening to your interview on Planetary Radio, and you made the mistake of saying something about gaming. Uh -huh. And of course, of course, you know, you, you've designed board games and we're going to talk about those, but you mentioned RPGs. And so I thought, okay, I'm sorry. What's the worst he can say? No, we, I, I, we have to hear this. So if we will go wherever you want, maybe we'll start with, with the games you've been developing, um, yeah. cause they're not your typical, um, and maybe we could get into, you know, what, why board games, why RPGs, how does that intersect with the other parts of your life? Yeah, I've been an avid gamer since I can remember. In high school, we had massive Dungeons & Dragons campaigns. We would stay up, I'm sure, as your audience knows, for days on end. Uh, it was a penalty to go to sleep. Like, your character would get penalized if you slept wow. through the campaign. So you really had to try to keep going to pre to produce that kind of endurance feel if you're on a massive adventure. And, and what I really loved about it, and especially as I saw the transition over to video games, was how personal it is. You know, you're sitting around a table, everything's analog, you've got nice physical components, they, they're crafted in many cases lovingly, you can just see the artistic intentions that went into the games. And it really is that, that socialization aspect that I think is so important, and that we're losing more and more of as technology plays a larger role in our life. So I wanted my children to have that experience. And we had family Dungeons and Dragons campaigns, especially oh. when my boys were little. Wow. I would be the dungeon master. And it was a double geek out session because I would build the dungeons in Legos. And so oh. I'd have each of the rooms ready to go. And I had like this secret box of all the different rooms. And I could mix the dungeon up depending on how the campaign was going. And they'd get into the next room and there would be a Lego room that was laid out. And there'd be little chests and secret doors and treasures that were hidden and puzzles that I would build into that. So they got to, at a very young age, they were probably, you know, starting at ages four and six. Wow. We were playing with Legos and playing with Dungeons and Dragons, and I'd be telling the story and they would be moving their characters through uh, the realms. And so it was, for me, a bonus because I got to play with Legos and then I got <laughs> to also lead a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. <laughs> That is awesome. I think I think the idea of, of using Legos, man, I wish I had thought of that when when my kids were younger. I mean, that is just I mean I'm with you on the fact that having tactile, you know, and a tactile approach to gaming, I can't get into video games as much as I can to to having that feel, but using Legos to create dungeons, I mean so Yeah, it was kind of born out of, you know, um 
opportunity because we had, as most families probably do, a set of giant bins of Legos oh, with yeah. tons of characters in them. And we had, in, in those days, we were collecting the Monster Hunter sets. And so you had all the monsters. Uh, and so it made for great Dungeons and Dragons campaigns very easily. And one of my favorite moments, and it's it's probably not, you know, maybe even traumatic for my son, but <laughs> there was the little were werewolf head that you could put up when a character turned into a werewolf. And he got, he drank a cursed potion and then turned into a werewolf. And I took his character and I put the little werewolf head and let out the howl. And he just freaked out. <laughs> so, and I was like, you know, don't worry, don't worry. There's the solution. You know, you just got to solve this. So I had to kind of talk him back into the dungeon, but it really got to him that, oh my goodness, I just turned into a werewolf now. And he, he was really upset about it. So you could just tell he was invested in the character and in the story. That is dedicated parenting. That's, that's funny because my kids, wow. my kids are adult and yeah. are adults now. And I still have Legos just randomly around <laughs> even here right now. So exactly. Yes. You know. We still have the giant bins. They're great when people come and visit and yeah. uh, we're getting more, more advanced in, in our sculptures these days. Now, uh, granted this, uh, this is what I'm about to say is true as we're recording. It might not be such recent news you know, when this drops in a little while, but I've been seeing a lot online that D and D and Lego are now collaborating. Have you guys seen this? They're like dedicated. Oh, no. They're I, I. It's a little weird to me, but like they're putting out these, and I don't watch live plays, but they're putting out these live plays, and like the setup is all D and D sanctioned official Lego things. I think you just did major damage to my bank account. So. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> okay, I'm. I'm. It could be the though. reverse, though, Dante, because you might have actually done something that you could have copyrighted or trademarked. So. <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> I I had when I was because we we are all three of us of approximately the same age. I think we're all within a handful of years. I mean, certainly based on the gray that we can see on the camera, because this is an audio only. We're definitely all within range. Um, and like as a kid, almost all of my Legos, so like little, like in the 80s, they were all the space sets, right? When those were coming out. Um, yep. And so, you know, you had the specialized pieces for like the windscreens and the wings. But otherwise, I loved that the Legos were not hyper dedicated, that you could make almost anything out of almost any set within reason if you had a sufficient number. Yeah, they've gotten much more specialized now. But yeah, they really are. If you collect enough, you know, you've got a pretty good inventory. <laughs> right. Well, Lego, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Dante, will make a dent. Yeah, that's yeah. so cool. So, okay, so do you still, because your your kids are, I'm guessing your kids are around our kids. You Do you still play, like you or you and your family? Well, uh, my older son has moved on and he's not playing. My younger son still plays, but, you know, he's 15 and he's got his own group of right. friends. And and mm -hmm. so playing with dad isn't as cool. Uh, we do. We've done more uh, kind of canned adventures like Gloomhaven and okay. uh, Return to Dark Tower. So where we can sit down just for a few hours uh, as a family and play as opposed to an extended campaign. It also got a lot harder for me to be the dungeon master because <laughs> when you do it right, it's a lot of work. Yeah. And I just ran out of time uh, yeah. with, the, with the other job that I had of flying to an asteroid. Right. I mean, you were a little busy, like all consumingly, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. So, so the the uh, the time I was able to spend kind of dwindled, and and the kids have their own circles now, and it's great. I love to see them out playing role playing with their friends because that's what I started in high school, especially. Yeah, but now at some point along the way, you started creating, not just playing games. How did what motivated that? Yeah, I started creating board games in 2013, and it was in response to a decision that NASA made that I was pretty unhappy about, which is that they decided to remove the education and public outreach component yeah. mm -hmm. of the OSIRIS-REx mission. And that was one of the things I was most excited about. I'm a professor. I went into this job because I love to teach and I love to inspire young uh, minds. And so losing the education program seemed pretty short-sighted and really kind of a tragedy because this is a huge investment that the United States taxpayers are making. And the reason we make these investments is primarily the inspirational value mm -hmm. and showing people what you can accomplish when groups of humans get together with a focused objective. So I, I started a after-school science club at the local boys and girls clubhouses in Tucson. Mm -hmm. Kind of just started going on my own and, and saying, hey, you know, what would the kids like to do? And I was inspired by their interest in rockets. 
And I always said they kind of had the cartoon rocket in mind, which was like Bugs Bunny gets falls asleep in the rocket and the whole thing launches and the whole thing lands on Mars. And that's not how rockets normally work, although Starship's getting close to that now. So we're, we're starting to see that model. But I was like, well, they don't understand first stage, second stage at the nose cone and that you're really just launching this tiny spacecraft mm -hmm. compared to the giant rocket. So I created some trading cards and I had the different brands of rocket like the Atlas and the Delta and the Falcon. And they were really excited and they were trying to stack up the, the right sequence of cards to get the rocket built. And then that's I would cool. say, okay, first the first stage falls away so we could throw that card away. Then the fairing opens up and you could throw those two cards away. And then it's just the spacecraft attached to the second stage and eventually those separate and the spacecraft goes off on its journey. And in addition to role-playing game, I was also a huge strategy board game player in high school okay. and even yeah, more in yeah. college. We played the big tabletop campaign games like Axis and Allies and Supremacy were particularly mm -hmm. popular uh, back in that era. And so I said, well, Let's make a let's make a game out of it and see what we can do. And I went on Kickstarter and I just laid out my case. It's kind of fun to go back and watch the original video. I was in my office and I just made my case. I'm a professor. I'm trying to teach kids about rockets. I want to make a board game. And I got a really good response. I, I think like thirty five thousand dollars or something we raised, wow. which was enough to allow me to print like five thousand copies of the game, <laughs> which ultimately came to be called Extronaut. And it was it was part educational and then it beca became part therapeutic. It, one thing that people note is it's pretty cutthroat game because each player is trying to get their spacecraft to a mission. Like you could be going to the moon or you could be going to Mars or whatever. There's a certain size of rocket that you're going to need to get you to that destination and score your points. But anytime there was an obstacle that was hitting us in the mission, I said, okay, I'm going to put this in the game. So there's government shutdown cards in the game. There's national priorities where the Air Force can steal one of your major components because they took our main engine oh, for our rocket. My God. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so it kind of became therapeutic in the sense that I'm going to I'm going to put this in the game so that everybody gets to experience the frustration. So the game turned out to be more competitive than I thought it was going to be when I first started designing it. But it was it was a decent hit. I think we ended up selling about fifteen thousand copies of it over wow. the next years or so. Wow. And because of that, we were inspired to continue with the science themed games. Mm -hmm. And I uh, the second one I released was called Constellations. And in many ways, it was the opposite of Extronaut. It's meant to inspire that peaceful feeling of going out at a dark sky and looking up and seeing the stars and just appreciating the beauty of the universe. It's a set collection game. It's got mechanics similar to Ticket to Ride. And every constellation has a different set of stars that are needed. And when you collect that set, you get to place the constellation into the night sky. And it's a puzzle. And the more gems you match, the more points you score. And that won the Mensa Select Award and a couple other wow. awards. So it really got some good recognition. And so we were kind of off and running. And we did uh, three more games in, with that company called Extronaut over the course of Jeez. the next uh, eight years. We were in business for about eight years. And we turned that into a science club. We, we grew the science club at the Boys and Girls Clubhouses. What we did is I started recruiting undergraduate students at the University yeah. of Arizona. And I said, just go play games with the kids. They'll love it. And just having a college student come to the clubhouse from the University of Arizona and talk to them. And that goes back to my point, tabletop gaming and role-playing gaming it's a very social uh, occurrence. You have to be around a table. You're having fun. You're talking. Yeah. You're looking at real people. You're talking to real people. And so it was a huge hit. And we ended up teaching a class called Gameful Learning and Community Outreach, where we taught undergraduate students how to be mentors using science-themed board games, not just my games, but a lot of different games uh, in the clubhouses on a weekly basis. That's incredible. I I can honestly, I, again, I'm not a board game person, somewhat to the chagrin of my daughters. However, I really want to play these games now, hearing you talk about them. I actually think Extronaut would be right up my alley. Maybe not healthy, but right up my alley. <laughs> right. Like this is right. Summer's coming. We, there's there's time. Exactly. So unfortunately, they're all out of print. So you're going to have to go after market. But if you ask okay. me nicely, I do have a few copies in reserve for special friends. We will ask you nicely after this recording. Yeah. You, you yeah. got it. Um, wow. Um, there's just, boy, there's just so many, so many threads with that. Um, that's, I mean, that's all such a major undertaking 
presumably because you've been using. Can I can I interject, Jason? Oh, yeah, and yeah. Ask just real quick. So that kind of it sounds to me that kind of like ran its course and and kind of stopped it. It kind of stopped just because of kind of what had been going on in your day job per se, or um, any other reason. Not that I want to jump in anything that we shouldn't jump into. No, no, it's a good question because uh, the industry just took off and became really popular and Mm -hmm. the competition was intense. And so I think I would, if I posted my little Kickstarter video from 2013 today, I wouldn't get any support because there's just so many options for backers Mm -hmm. to choose Mm -hmm. from. I think it's something like three or 4,000 board game titles are being released every year now. I had no idea. And so I thought about it and I said, I think I could succeed in this business, but it would be the thing that I'm doing. It would be like, okay, I'm going to focus on becoming a board right. game, you know, company runner and instead right. of, you know, the NASA mission. So I, I just decided I didn't have the energy and the time and that, yeah. and I was proud of what we made. And I said, okay, it's time to move on. And, and I started writing books as, as my next creative outlet. Do you still, do you still, outside of the ones that you created, do you still do any board gaming, like per se, like for example, you know, Jason laughs at me, but I'm still like a big Twilight Imperium fan. Oh, um, yeah. You know, do you still do any sort of board gaming now? I do. Actually, I still am on Kickstarter and I still back games. So I, I, I tend nice. to go to the Kickstarter platform because I appreciate what they're trying to do there. And I especially like to see people who are starting off and it's a good boost my favorite thing is to be the backer that puts them over their target to be the one that, that helps the campaign succeed. So I'll often wait and, and to try to try to be the backer that is the one that, that makes them hit their funding goal. So I, I do that. I love uh, restoration games. I mentioned Return to Dark Tower. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But when I was a kid, Dark Tower was the Christmas present of the year for me. I wanted nothing but Dark Tower. And I got it for Christmas. It was an awesome game. It had this big black tower in the middle and there's four kingdoms that you had to journey around and a little computer. So you could play it alone, which was really important. So you could go around the world and you had to fight brigands and you had to get go into temples and and shrines and things like that to find keys. And I just thought it was amazing. And the sequel, Return to Dark Tower, is is awesome. And that's one of my favorites right now. And we play that. My my sons and I still play that one. That's awesome. When you were designing these, to back up for a sec, you kept using the plural. I, I mean, th- you must have had a team. You must have asked for input. That sounds like such a significant undertaking. Yeah, a lot of it was with my kids. So we went from playing games together to designing games together. And then oh, it got wow, to be a really wow. fun family activity. But whenever you're designing a board game, you have to test it and test it and test it yeah. because you don't know where it's going to break. Mm-hmm. And as you know, gamers love to break games. So we would have a cadre of testers, you know, brutal testers. Their their job is to go in and see where does this game break? Where would a player get stuck and they have no chance of victory? And so, yeah, there was a big testing community that I would go to. Partly was my boys and girls clubs kids. Partly yeah, was my yeah. undergraduate students. Partly was my own <laughs> kids and their friends. And really anybody else I could rope into sitting down with me for a couple hours and, and playing through a game. And and so it was the testing is the real critical part. And the, the really interesting thing is that's exactly the same as building a spacecraft, right? You test it and you test it and you test it and see where it's going to break. So by the time you're in action, you don't worry about anything going wrong. So things going wrong and extended missions. What what's life for like for you now on the professional front now that Osiris Rex is, you know over and it's it's apex or apex rex no yeah, osiris apex osiris apex. Osiris yeah. apex what i mean that's a major shift but is it still the same pace is it still the same pressure well i can put it this way i think i've become famous and i have been on a victory tour and so there's been <laughs> all kinds of celebrations we're getting yeah. trophies we got the goddard memorial trophy we got the that's collier cool. trophy Collier Trophy is like the biggest award in aerospace in the United States. People like the crew of Apollo 11 and Orville Wright and Chuck Yeager have won the Collier Trophy. And now Osiris Rex has won the Collier Trophy. So I've been at a lot of galas, a lot of VIP events. Uh, I've worn my tuxedo more this year than I have in the past (laughs) decade, probably. And it's been intense. I mean, it sounds great, but it's also a lot. And I'm like, wow, 
and people are reaching out to me that, and I can't say no, especially when an invite like you guys sent comes through. I'm like, I got to talk to them. That sounds so so fun. Yeah. So I'm still doing a lot of media. I'm st the book yeah. came out, and there was yeah. the whole book promotion activity. So I feel like uh, in some ways life is more intense because there's yeah. a lot of attention, a lot of interest, all positive, but but nonstop. And so it's I've been getting some science done. I mean, the mission's yeah. not yeah. over in the sense that the final phase of the mission is sample analysis. Yeah. So we're in laboratories. We've got six graduate students just here at the University of Arizona working on the samples. Yeah. And I've just uh, put up on archive.org the first paper, if anybody's interested. Oh, outstanding. You can download the, the first set of scientific results. I wanted to get that out quickly because um, the whole world is now right. uh, possible to request samples from NASA for their own science. Yeah. Oh, congratulations, Dante. That's that's fast. Yes, that was that was the goal, right? And yeah. we we wanted to get it out there quickly. Like I said, we knew the NASA would put the catalog out after six months. Okay, we, we hit that mark, so it came out in March. And I wanted the community to have a decent reference to what we knew about the collection, mm -hmm. so that they could intelligently request their own materials uh, and have a good basis uh, for their mm -hmm. um, the requests going yeah. into NASA. So just to 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 geek out in this direction for a sec, if we might. Um, so I, I didn't know that was out there, so I haven't seen it yet. Um, but since it's out there, it's fair game. Any surprises that especially delighted you? Yes, I, I've uh, got one that I'm so excited about. So when we were orbiting around Bennu and taking all those high resolution images of the surface, we saw some very compelling features. There were these bright white, very large veins, like a meter yeah. long and 10 centimeters thick that we inferred to be carbonate minerals. Yeah. Carbonates, people are probably familiar with, if you live in an area with hard water, it forms the white crusty stuff that blocks up your shower heads and your faucets. And it's almost entirely formed through precipitation. Right. So you have the carbonated fluid like a soda, mm -hmm. and then you have calcium. And then when the water goes away, the calcium and the carbonate bond, and they make these calcite minerals. So we were fully expecting we would find calcites and then we started seeing particles and most of them are really dark and black like the asteroid is and mind bogglingly black actually they're kind of your brain has a hard time parsing what you're seeing when you're looking at something so dark but some of them were coated in this white crusty material and i was like oh we got the carbonates that's going to be so cool we're going to see what came out of the water on this asteroid and then we started looking at them and they were phosphates which means they're loaded in phosphorus which is a central element to life and in mm -hmm. fact, I did a lot of my early astrobiology research on phosphorus chemistry. There's, you know, we say the big six elements uh, for studying life. There's obviously carbon and hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And phosphorus is number six. Yeah. And it's the lowest abundance element that life uses. It's the lowest in the universe and also very low in biology. So I had thought early on, if you could figure out how phosphorus got incorporated into life, that would give you some real clues to its origin. And then to see this phosphate crust covering some of our stones, it was it was really surprising because I had never seen it before. And I've been studying yeah. meteorites for 30 years. Yeah. So first off, we brought back something that's that's not present in meteorites. So that was a huge goal of mine. And when I gave the lecture at the American Geophysical Union in December, I called out to the audience and I said, hey, we found this really interesting phase. I have never seen it. I can't find anything in the scientific literature about its occurrence on Earth. If you've come across something like this, please come and talk to me. And I got a colleague came up and he said, we just published a paper last year. We saw this material coming out of the plumes of Enceladus, which is oh, one of the moons on. of Saturn that has these oh. active geysers and shooting plumes of water and other minerals into space. And I was like, okay, this is so cool because we were starting to formulate the idea that Bennu, which is really just a bunch of rubble of, from a collision of a much larger asteroid in the main asteroid belt, that what we call parent asteroid, looks like it formed out around Saturn, like way out in the outer solar system. It probably had a lot of water ice, but also carbon dioxide, what we would call dry ice. Mm -hmm. Ammonia, the thing is loaded with ammonia, which is the nitrogen um, compound that we're interested in. And and now we're like, I think this thing came from an ocean world. I think this was oh a, a liquid body in the early solar system, concentrating phosphorus. There's tons of organic molecules all over this sample. 
So I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Brad because if I respond to this, I'm we're just going to totally go down this. Well, road. I don't even know. That's I mean, absolutely amazing. I just have to. I mean, it's fun. okay. I just, but it's sorry, but phosphorus and its derivatives, right? They're getting a lot of play these days in the research in surprising places, right? And there's debate around that, but oh my god, that's just amazing. Yeah, I mean, phosphorus is central to our life. It makes the backbone of our DNA right. and our RNA. It makes the membranes of our cells. Those are all phospholipids. And uh, in us, in humans and animals, it makes our teeth and our bones. And so it's 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 we wouldn't be alive without it. This is one of those things so that I just cool. and and as someone whose whose background isn't necessarily in science, um, it seems to me that over time this is going to get more and more play. Um, you could kind of tell that, you know, people out there are hungering for more science because they're grasping at things that are even what you would kind of consider. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not disparaging it, you know, more fringe science, this idea of extraterrestrial life and all that, when they're going to hear and see things that are much more palatable, scientifically proven, you know, data is there. Um, it's going to, it's, it, it, yeah. I, I have to think that once it catches on in mainstream media, maybe the wrong term, regular yeah. full on broadcast media, it's it's going to hit a critical mass. I think so. And and so I mentioned my paper came out. My paper is kind of like, here's what we got, kind of an right, overview right. of the collection and its basic properties. But we've got over 100 papers lined up, including a lot that are now focused on this phosphate phase, tons of cool experiments that we want to do. There was another paper that came out just uh, two months ago where they found very similar chemistry in a lake in British Columbia called Last Chance Lake. And uh, I just got funded by the Explorers Club. Thank you to them to, to send yes. myself and a student up to that lake. Yes. And we want to get some of that fluid. We want to evaporate it, see what kind of crusts form, see if it looks yeah. like the stuff that's on Bennu. So it's showing up in a, in a lot of astrobiologically relevant environments. The paper about the phosphate lake in Canada is focused on implications for origin of life. Just thanks for sharing that with us. It's just that that that's just beautiful. I, I don't know what else to say. That's just so so cool. Um, before we have to let you go, because we want to be really respectful of your time, and it's end it's got to be end of semester for you. Just well, before like you before you do that, I'm going to ask a gaming question. Just good, because yeah. that's yeah, I was coming back. Yep. Yeah. Good. Just because we've talked a lot about high fantasy and fantasy games, and with you know, everything you do with, with, we kind of dance around it more for humor's sake with your day job. Mm -hmm. um, you know, other than all the work you did with board gaming and everything like that, do you, do you like playing sci-fi games or do you kind of like, you know what, I'm kind of living in, yeah, in, more a, of a, D &D guy. in a science yeah. world. I kind of like to play in a fantasy world. Um, does it really matter to you? Yeah, no, I've never thought about it before. But now that you say that, I do gravitate towards the fantasy games uh, when I'm sitting down. And I think it is because of, yeah, I'm all day, every day, I'm in the solar system. We're talking about rockets and flying around. So I've played uh, <laughs> Twilight Imperium, uh, Cosmic Encounter. I, I do enjoy yeah. that one. I like the way the, the different alien characters really d create a dynamic that can change every time you sit down. But like I mentioned, Gloomhaven is pretty popular. Uh, Heroes of Air, Land, and Sea is another giant one that me and my boys get out. And there's elves and orcs and humans, and you know, you're trying to explore and and conquer. And uh, the one I'm most excited about, I recently backed on Kickstarter that should be delivering soon, is Crossbows and Catapults. So it's it's the one where you you know you've got you set up your castles and you actually are firing the little uh, missiles and trying to knock the soldiers down and knock the castles down. And so I played that like crazy when I was a kid. Oh, and again, it's it's this restoration game. So they're tapping into that nostalgia for me uh, very well. And then if I can also expose more of my extreme nerddom, I collect um, D Dungeons and Dragons action figures primarily from the 1980s, yeah. from the LJN line. And uh, I started that probably about a, maybe a year and a half ago. And it was great <laughs> because it, it gives you all these great memories of when you were a kid. But more importantly, I can just hand my wife a list of toys and now I get toys for Christmas. So, <laughs> and, and I'll also horrify collectors. My favorite thing to do is get the figure in the package and open it up. Good for you. Hey, good you know, for I, you. I'm, I'm the same yes. way. 
and and I might have to introduce my wife to yours because I've been still trying to get her to do that, and I just <laughs> haven't gotten to it. Jason, right. I'm gonna hand it over in a minute, just because Jason laughs every time I ask that question about the sci-fi thing, just because he knows oh. I have this obsession yes. with with the Traveler RPG, which is like you know hardcore sci-fi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm I'm somewhat obsessed with it as someone who isn't got a scientific background. I'm more somewhat yes. business and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and I know the, the what the game you're talking about, because back in that same time period, I played a I'm not a big video game guy, but I played a video game called Castles, mm -hmm. which was very similar to that Castles and Castles 2. Right. And I remember sitting there for hours and I actually had to make a DOS virtual machine on my computer so i could play that again you um you know but but yeah i just my head's still swimming from all this the science and all that but i did also back it as well um and i'm not uh, i'm i'm a little more selective just because um i have to be cautious as to how many boxes come in the mail on a daily basis jason knows how my mm -hmm. my um significant other operates but um I, right. I, the, I, the, the I, first I, step is admitting, Brad, you have a problem. And I do have a problem. I will admit <laughs> that. Jason Jason knows what my bookshelf yeah. looks like, yeah, and it's a I'm beautiful ready thing, to though. admit that. So. Yeah, so I have a pretty good rule. My game cabinet is finite, and if a new game comes in and oh. I don't have room, another one has to go. The good news is, though, I, I'm the oldest of, of uh, my siblings, and my brothers have younger kids, so we can often pull the younger kid games and ship them off for the next generation to play with. So I'm, I'm still working my way through that. Nice. nice. I, d I have the same rule, except I always say to her, yeah, I, I know I have that rule. I'll get to that next week. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so b before we let you go to maybe bring this to a close, just one more observation or question. And this comes out, I think Dante somewhat in your book, but chatting with you this afternoon, it's, it's really ostensible. You have so much going on you know, professionally, avocationally, how those two hybridize with the games and whatnot. But you're clearly deeply committed to your family and to your kids. And that that's something that resonates, I think, very powerfully with both of us. You must have so little time available. Yet every, I mean, over the past half an hour, you have routinely come back to, you know, X, Y, or Z interaction is with one or more of your kids, right? And that's, I love that. How do you find or make the time for that uh, with everything going on? Yeah, it was a, a conversation my wife and I had very early on when I was first considering joining this program. She's mm -hmm. also a planetary scientist, and mm -hmm. so she's in the business. She understands yeah. what kind of commitment it was. And we agreed it had to be a family adventure. It was not just me going off and disappearing. Mm -hmm. So the kids came with us to a lot of the activities and events. They were there. They got to go into the you know Lockheed Martin and see the spacecraft as we were building it. When we were on site preparing for launch, we all moved to Florida. And we lived in Florida for three months. And we got a condo on the beach. And grandma came and watched the kids. And I got to drive to Kennedy Space Center every day to go to work. It was a dream come true. They were there for the launch. They were there when we got the sample. They were in Utah when the capsule came home. So it's been part of their life. They've been part of the adventure. We talk about it a lot. And when I'm in Tucson, you know, I go home at five and that evening is family time. And I don't do weekends unless it's an emergency. And part of it, it and I extended that to my team. And it wasn't just me as the boss that wow. had that privilege. It was everybody. I said, you know, family comes first. And if you have a, something you need to go do to take care of your family, just let us know. And we got your back and we'll yeah. cover it and we'll make sure that everything is ready for you when you return. And then my team pays that back to me as well. And they understand that Dante needs to spend time with his family, especially when the kids are little. Mm -hmm. My son learned to crawl. I think it's in the book in the uh, hallway of a Maryland hotel. So when they were really little, they just came with me. And, and so yeah. I would come home to the hotel home and uh kate and, and my kid would be there and so we would have the family night together we try as much as possible to do family dinner uh almost every night it's getting a little harder because the kids are you know, my yeah. oldest son is 17 now yeah. and yeah. He's, he's got his life mm -hmm. he's got a car he's got a job and so you know he's he's doing his thing but we still spend a lot of time together and so it's it was something we committed to very early on and it i think the family feels like this was their mission it's not just dad's mission and with all of that, you've all had 
all of that productivity and all of that success in spite of what we're all taught about having to work. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you you know you can draw boundaries. It's really important. You can't give up your life uh, mm -hmm. for for your jobs. You got to find that right balance. And when you build it into the culture, especially of a team that you know you can do that on, it it it's not as hard as people think. The other thing is, I work smart. Like when I'm at work, I'm not goofing around on the internet or you know I'm like working. I'm like I want to get everything done I can mm -hmm. in these eight or nine hours. Mm -hmm. So I can spend that time with my family and and you realize it's real easy to waste time at work. And then, you you know, you didn't get stuff done. So it's like you work smart, you work hard, and then you also have earned the time that you spend outside of work. Dante, thank you so much for wasting a little time with us. It's It's been a true pleasure. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I'm glad you enjoyed the book. Before we head over and, and sit down and have a drink on, at Autobahn Court, I do want to, I know we kind of haven't done it this way, but I want to jump right into what we just talked about, which is a yeah. little different. First of all, the science of all of this. I We we kind of alluded to this before the interview um, about, in effect, the empathy and compassion and the ethics he has in regards to work. And look at how successful yeah. yes. things are. And it's not just him. He he permeates this culture of family and recharging and all that with, with the team. Um, but for me, just listening to him talk as a layperson in science, very layperson, a lot of a lot of what I get from science is stuff that you send me saying, you know, this, this is interesting. You know, you should read this. You give me a lot of articles and all that. Cause you know, what will, what will attract attention, what will attract my attention space wise yeah. and otherwise. Um, and this was, this is one of the programs that you knew would, and just listening to him talk about phosphates alone. I mean, normally people would be like phosphates, big deal, but listening to him talk about that, I don't think, and and like you said, it's going to be a while before it really starts to to get public traction. Yeah, but it sounds yeah. to me, just as layperson, that that's a. I mean, this is going to be a bigger deal than I think people realize. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly, then the public realizes. Presumably, a lot of the people in the field are are aware of this. But but like like Dante said, you know, finding the phosphate things like that, there are things that are unexpected and are astrobiologically titillating right like mm -hmm. and that's 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 the beauty of exploration and to kind of maybe pull it full circle it's sort of the beauty of playing some not all but some tabletop role playing games of mm -hmm. of being able to have the little experiences like that that are unexpected and remarkable and lasting and i want to what's once one more thing and then we'll go to court cuz i want to talk about his games um the thing about his his family and all that, and I kind mm -hmm. of alluded to it because I have very strong feelings about all of this. Um, look at how successful that mission has been so far. And I don't think we even have a full grasp of that yet because right. the data is still coming out, right? Mm -hmm. um, his family is up there mm -hmm. with his work. Yeah, how cool his, is that? His wife works in the same field. They, they, you know, they in effect made a commitment to maintaining a nuclear family and functioning that way. He encourages his staff to recharge. Yeah, I mean the the, the it, leadership culture, the lab yes. culture, the team culture. I mean, I could see how powerfully that was resonating with you on screen when we chatted. Because I mean, like you said, you're literally writing a chapter on this. And, yeah, and and look, well, at and the you're proof and you're a professor of leadership, so. You know, it not only so for both of us in different ways, perhaps just from my perspective, hearing him doing it and and hearing his his beliefs on that and then seeing it's not a just imagine this is not just a, a company. This is a large scale scientific project. And I'm I am just understating what it is oh, and yeah. seeing the success by it and being able to do it at the same time. Business should take heed. Yep, um, businesses right. should take heed and realize that you can you can be humane with your with yeah, your employees exactly. and still be successful. And like you yeah. said, I'm for whatever reason it is, you and our 
friend of the podcast, your friend, um, and and uh, co-author Aaron Peterson, Professor Dr. Aaron Peterson, um, are allowing me to write a chapter on this, and um, mm-hmm. it's a um, it's a it's a passion thing, and I'm grateful for that. But oh, just hearing it, anything. just hearing just hearing him talk about that, yeah, but it was so impressive. It was, I mean, I I wasn't able to record on the day that we originally planned to record this. Um, but I know that when you and I got offline from it, we were, I think we both were kind of like, we need to process, which is what we tended to need to do mm-hmm. with a lot of our discussions, mm-hmm. but especially after this one. And for me, it was both because of the science and the ethics of it, the science and the humanity of it. Um, and so for all those reasons and more, um, Dante, thank you so much. You were, it was an eye opening discussion. And I really hope that um, more people hear both of the science and of, and of your life experience and how you, how you have run things and how family is important. I think, I think more people need to hear that. And, and everybody pick up Dante's book, The Asteroid Hunter. Yes. It's a really, really good read. Yes. Let's go over to, because even though Autobahn Court, I don't remember really having uh, a um, a gaming, like a board game section. I don't think In so. In our Autobahn Court, we do. <laughs> we and, do. And, and, and ironically, there are games there by Dante Loretta. And, dun, dun, dun. and um, I know that you're angling to potentially try to find a copy or two of his games i haven't pulled um, the trigger yet but it i found i i i can get like they're out there the 2.0 version is yeah. out there i'm really is intrigued it? yeah i've i've pondered it but i figured what i do is if there's a limitation around them i was going to give you first crack mm. because ultimately the only time i play them the only people i'd be able to play them with would be right you. Right. Same here. You. Right. So um, the only other thing I would do would be we both get one and then we'd have to set up the boards on 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 our tables and then be able to play and move both parts and play remotely, which I've seen done before, too, with yeah. games like Twilight Imperium. And so yeah. On. And and um, I haven't I haven't looked into it. Full disclosure. Uh, I, I should say I haven't looked further into it uh, after that that afternoon recording, because as, as as we record this. We just spoke with Dante not even a week ago, and mm-hmm. um, it was end of semester for me, and so things have been busy. And now going going into this new week, um, I will be digging digging back into that. Um, what uh, what is on your desk, uh, and or Kindle, and or tabletop? Oh, um, well, you know, I've been I've been um. I don't know if I talked too deeply into it, but I've been doing a lot of self-study around some programming and yeah. um, database stuff just related to work mm-hmm. um, and related to broadening my skill set in my job hunt, which has gone on um, a lot longer than I'd hoped. But what I found out, and I won't get into it too, too deeply, it's not a, it's not, I'm not looking for violins or anything. It's just fascinating to me how much the tech field and i could go into all different verticals whether it's healthcare finance saas whatever is going through a large scale reset and i talked yeah. to a recruiter on friday who was based out of chicago and we were talking about this because i've never experienced this before working since working on real in effect 30 years this year 94 is when i started working Wow. Because I because I started working really two years before you graduated, and yeah. I I went part time to finish my bachelor's later. Yep. Um, I've never seen it like this before. Yeah. And it has virtually nothing. Let me rephrase that. It has the market itself has very little to do with the changes related to AI. Mm-hmm. It is still a market correction in many ways related to the pandemic. Um, and we could discuss it here. I just, I won't bore people um, where AI is, 
Just yeah, where I is pretty much. You're right. Where I is <laughs> taking hold is no, no, no. It, it this can get very boring for people that are because you and I talk about this a lot, a lot. Absolutely. And, and for me, I find it fascinating. I'll be honest with you. I am more than aware that most people find it boring. But um, where I, AI is taking hold is when it comes to submitting your resumes. Um, yeah. And and I'll I'll leave this term and then we'll move on. Um, because I've been a hiring manager for years now, or I have been. Mm -hmm. if I could find someone that had 85% of what I wanted, yeah, um, they were most likely going to be my hire. If they had 90%, I figured I was in real luck. Okay. Now companies are looking for what they call, you'll hear, see this term out there. They're looking for the unicorn. They're looking for the unobtainable person or being, which right. is they want someone that has 99.59% of what right. they want. Right. Um, there are people like that, but I and I haven't even talked to you about all of this yet. And and there's more that I'll we'll talk about offline. But um, someone that I talked to um, had said the problem is for people like me. I have I've always been someone who has been pulled into multiple areas. Right. So I have a lot of skill, a lot of areas, but I'm not a unicorn in one specific area. Mm -hmm. I am a unicorn in terms of my skill set around all. That's hard to market. And that's where I've had right. Problems. And there's a lot right. of people like me, yeah, like that. So I'm not alone. So that being said, I've been trying yeah. to to deepen my skill set in certain areas where I think it mm -hmm. makes me more marketable. It's so cool. So that's here. really been my yeah. That's been yeah. that's been my focus area. Now that being said, <laughs> um, we did have an announcement come through as we record this the previous week <laughs> that something went on presale. I don't and, know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know you don't yeah. because you beat me to it. No. Oh, yeah. Wait. Yeah, I did. Yeah, you beat me to it. Oh, you yeah. You beat me to it. Um, and I'll I'll let you handle that one. But um, the other one is um, – I'll, I'll save that. It's a traveler thing, but I'll save that for the next episode, and I'll let you talk about what I just kind of alluded to. So I'm just going to say a word about it because I'm actually going to go somewhere else. Okay. And and, and we will be talking a lot more about this thing mm -hmm. in the over the summer as yes. more is released. Um, uh, for those of you who haven't guessed the obvious yet, uh, uh, as we record this, now this is being recorded um, fairly well in advance, uh, several weeks before it drops. But as we record this still back in the early days of May, uh, Modifius uh, announced the pre-order for the Star Trek Adventure second edition core rule book. And um, needless to say, I was exceptionally pleased at this news and immediately pre-ordered. Oh, and yeah. I do not daily check to see if the PDF has been released. I don't. Uh, speaking of Star Trek books, I'm going to I'm oh, gonna... I will say this. Oh, that yeah. was such a that was such a tease when I ordered it, and it said download here. Oh, I know the download. God, and Jim. it said it said placeholder <laughs> here for when it's released. And I was right. I was it was like a drum roll, and then it was like the Price is Right thing, or it went thousands of thousands of pre orders around the world simultaneously yelling out, "Come!" <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, to 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 walk us out of Audubon Court toward the close. Uh, I am inherently uncomfortable doing this, but uh, as you and our friend Aaron uh, have taught me, you take advantage of the opportunities to, to say stuff like this. So uh, this episode is dropping in very, very early June. Between the recording of the episode and the release of this episode, uh, Aaron and I are submitting proposals for two more books yes. to two different publishers. One book, which is already entirely written. Mm -hmm. uh, that proposal is going to be submitted probably in the days after this episode releases. And so uh, I'm asking all of you in our audience, uh, just shamelessly or shamefully, maybe both, uh, the best argument we can make Aaron and I can make for our publisher and our editor to be interested to move forward with book two proposal 
which you guys are going to, I think, really like, it's different, uh, is to sell more copies of our first book, uh, Leadership in Star Trek. We'll put it in the show notes. Um, but if you're listening to this and you like Star Trek or you know someone who likes Star Trek or you're in a position of leadership or would like to be or you know someone who is, uh, we would be grateful immensely if you'd do us a Star Trek solid and order the book, be it in print or on Kindle. Again, shameless self-promotion, but this is the way we're going to get the second book uh, proposal accepted and out the door in the coming year, which which is the goal. And I'll just tie it into this. The And we've talked about this, and obviously we've had Aaron on the show before, right? Mm -hmm. But um, And we'll have him back. But so much of what we talked about with Dante and the value of science and the value of compassion, and like you said, humane leadership, is is in our fair little book. So shameless mm -hmm. plug. Thanks everyone for indulging it. Probably won't be no, no, no here. Yet. And and normally I would do this offline, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do this here because everyone deserves a lesson. One, there's a difference between uh, shameful shilling and shameless shilling. Okay, you're saying you're doing it in a way that's very humble. You know, please help us if you if you feel so. Please, uh, yeah. yeah. Have another. Please, son, may I have another? <laughs> um, there's the other way is saying. You know you wanna. You know I deserve it. Put down the number because I'm that good. That's oh, the way I can feel that my I saw skin it. crawling. Yeah, pretty much. And that's <laughs> the that's the reason I'm not in sales anymore. And right. by me saying that, that probably just negated me from another couple jobs that I was probably <laughs> well done. At. But um, but no, that I I I don't think there's anything wrong with saying something like that. I think it's and and I would say this if I hadn't if I didn't know you and didn't get an autographed copy from both you and Aaron, um, as someone who is fascinated by empathy and compassion and leadership, mm -hmm. whether it had been written about start written in the context of star Trek or in the context of star Wars or in the context of whatever, mm -hmm. um, you and I've talked about this. There is a oh, yeah. lack of good material talking about leadership that isn't kitschy yep. or isn't tied to, some methodology that is subscription oriented, you know, whatever the case may be. And don't get me wrong. I've seen it. There's some good material out there. Don't get me wrong. But I think there need to be more, there needs to be more academic scientific material out there that talks mm -hmm. about what's good leadership material no. that isn't going to push someone's agenda of being on a speaker circuit or whatever the case is not that there's anything wrong with it. Mm -hmm. But you know what I I think yeah. I think you yep. know what I'm getting at, and I, I think do. anyone out here who's worked in the business world knows what I'm getting at. Every town, every big city has this. Join our leadership conference when we mm -hmm. have all these big names show up, and yeah. you come out of it and go, "Hey, well, at least I got a day out of work." Yeah. Um, you know, this is different. This is a different type of thing. If you want to understand and really have a deep thought and a, mm -hmm. and and have deep have a deep contextual internal discussion about what yeah. it means to be a leader then then this is this is a good start to that and thanks for that brad i mean i i mean that that's kind of our goal with with our book and you know if we can get more copies out there then this second one we've already written it's all about humility and i really believe that a lot of our audience is probably there with us on that one Oh, I would have no doubt. I know. I, 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 really I know. We've so. already. We've even talked about this with some of our audience members offline. We'll keep the names to ourselves, but yeah. Um, I know we have. You know, we've like like I said, we've had discussions with folks who are in complete agreement. All right, all on that note, shameful shilling over. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what to do. That is, be well, stay well. We will talk to you in a couple Whoop! more weeks. I had to do that. I, I normally let you let you get off without actually interrupting. So um, you should try to, to be well anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone. <laughs>